This is the I Read Comic Books Podcast, and I am your host for this week's episode, Paul J. Sley, filling in for the uncanny Mike Rappin, uh, who's off adventuring somewhere. I'm not quite where it's a location, and uh, his mission has been undisclosed to us. But we're here uh, to talk about comics, and I'm back talking to two of my favorite people who I saw last weekend at C2E2, Kara Shambowski. It's Shamborski, Paul. We've been I through know, this. I know. I know. As soon as I came out of my mouth, I realized I mispronounced it. It's okay. You're good. And... How are you? I'm good. Oh, and Brian Murray. Hi. That was exactly right, Paul. Good job. <laughs> At least I got that right. Well, the Irish are easy. How are you both doing? It's been a while since I've spoken to you. I said I saw you last week, but uh, it's good to talk to you again on the show. How are we doing? Well, well, Paul, thank you for asking, because I got con credit C2E2. I thought I had survived. I thought I was fine. I made it the first few days back at work, and I was like, oh, no con crud. This is new and different. And then on Thursday, I was like, oh, I'm dying. <laughs> so <laughs> thanks, Chicago. <laughs> I feel like I avoided con crud unless I just always feel kind of crappy, because <laughs> I, I didn't really notice the feel, feeling any worse since coming back. So hmm. No, I am I am definitely sick. And like I know this always happens, because you know, you're at a convention, you're surrounded by thousands of people with various levels of personal hygiene, and they're all bringing their germs in from wherever they're coming from. And you're not really sleeping, and you're not really eating great food because you know, you're in a convention center and right. you're exhausted. And then I, I, I flew back and I work in a school, which is a germ puddle. <laughs> and I, I don't know why I'm surprised that I'm sick, but here I am. Well, I'm glad you could make it on the show. You soldier through with a, with a, uh, injured foot and, uh, some con crud. You're apart. quite a power. You're quite a warrior. But in terms of comics, um, uh, yes, this week, I read a very delightful all ages book. Um, it's called Sheets, and it was written and illustrated by Brenda Thumler. And I had never heard of this book before. I, I saw it just pop up on uh, on the Hoopla app as something that my library had access to, and uh, it's published by First Second. And I tend to trust whatever they're publishing because they have a very uh, well curated range of graphic novels. So I gave it a whirl. And Sheets is about a girl named Marjorie whose mom died the previous year. Marjorie's in, I want to say, I want to say middle school. And she's basically running the family laundromat. And there's this, there's this like awful antagonist named Mr. Sauber Tuck. And he's like this. <laughs> this sleazy teardrop of a man who is like doing really overt things to try to sabotage the laundromat so that he can claim ownership of the property and open a five-star yoga and spa experience featuring himself. And so Marjorie's like, she's this kid who's just trying to run this laundromat. Her dad's like still not over his wife's death. So it's like kind of alluded to, that he's having some problems with alcohol, but not explicitly mentioned because, again, all ages book, but he's like not really around. So she's running the show. And then meanwhile, there's this little ghost boy named Wallace. Well, no, sorry, Wendell. And Wendell is he like comes back to our world from the spirit world. And he's he's a sheet like you think of a ghost, you think of the like the sheet Halloween costume. Mm -hmm. So in this book, all ghosts look like that because the sheet is the thing that holds their soul together when they've reached the next world. Hmm. And he like hops this like spirit train back to the living world because he feels like he doesn't belong in ghost world. And he ends up kind of making the laundromat a mess by building a sheet fort and like just generally causing chaos for Marjorie when she's just trying to make things happen in a way that doesn't let the family business fall to Mr. Salbertuck. And mm -hmm. it turns out that Wendell does end up helping her out in a positive way. But he's he's like a little kid, too. He's He was 11 years old when he died, and he still doesn't quite understand what's happening. So it's like these two outsider kids, one living and one dead, who are just trying to figure things out. And this really beautiful, co beautifully colored book, it takes place in a coastal town on Lake Erie in the late 90s. And there are so many visual references that are just, if you grew up in the 90s, you're like, oh, 
Jelly sandals, yes. Oh, that windbreaker parka with the chevron down the front. Go on. Like, it's just, I was like, this feels very familiar. Why does this feel very familiar? Oh, all these, like, it never really says, you know, very explicitly, like, this is a 90s nostalgia piece, but like, all the art is very, like, it, it feels like wrapping yourself up in a blanket. Or a sheet to, uh, you know, not or put a, too or a sheet, final point yeah. on it. Yeah. <laughs> well, that sounds yeah, lovely. I'll have to check that it, out. It, it, it was very lovely, and it was just a lovely thing to read while I'm ill and feeling very grumpy. <laughs> perfect, perfect. I was like, oh, there are nice things. Comics are the best medicine. I think I've heard that before. But um, <laughs> Brian, how, how about you? How have you been, and uh, what have you been reading this past week? I've been good. It's been a, been a pretty busy week. Uh, Kate and Lampier and I have continued to work on our new home, so there's been a lot of, like, what are we gonna? What color are we gonna paint stuff? And a lot of me going, <laughs> I don't know. Sure. Because oh. I've never like I haven't lived in a place where I could mm. paint before, so I haven't really thought about it. It's always been like apartments or rented houses or whatever. So now I have all this choice, and I'm I'm drowning in it. So Brian, I'm gonna need you to go to your local library and pick out any design book that says the word Domino on it. <laughs> Domino. <laughs> You're going to look at all of their beautiful, colorful, poppy aesthetic, and you're going to get some ideas. And then you're going to go to the local hardware store, and you're going to get some paint swatches, and you're going to see how the paint looks on the walls and how you like the light to look. And you have to be the adult and make some decisions here, Brian, because it's no longer a rental. Yeah, no, I I hear you. (laughs) Comics have been a lot easier to make choices about, though, because (laughs) I told the comic shop what I wanted a long time ago, and they just give it to me. Beautiful. I've got, uh, this week I managed to read Die number three and four, so I think I'm finally caught up on that. Yes. I don't know if, okay. Uh, it continues to be fantastic. I'm really enjoying the character explorations that they're doing. Yeah, as, as much as I love a good fantasy romp, I'm kind of enjoying the examination we're starting to get of Ash and Ash's sexuality and their attraction to different genders um i'm hoping that's going to be something that we continue to explore going forward just because i don't know i find human sexuality to be fascinating i also read buffy number three which if you're a buffy fan is good they're definitely veering a lot more into the high fantasy side of things than the original buffy tv show did you know this issue features a giant bat that can talk and wants to eat vampires and they just kind of like fight it in the middle of town in front of god and everybody (laughs) right so they're not really keeping the secret very well is it a comic that you think is accessible to people who didn't watch the show or is this very clearly like you are a buffy fan and you want more buffy read this book i think that it is accessible to people who are not fans but i think that people who were fans are definitely going to enjoy it more immediately because they don't have to get to know the characters Mm -hmm. so much but it's doing a lot of things that i like like um willow one of the characters from the original show who is also in this comic is a lesbian and in this they're just immediately like issue number one she's already come out like she has this cool punk girlfriend and it's it's a whole thing so they're already sidestepping a lot of the problematic relationships that the show suffered from the 90s was a time of learning for us all (laughs) (laughs) i would definitely recommend you know maybe wait for the trade to come out and then check it out from the library that's fair how about you paul what did you read how are you oh i i've been fantastic um like i mentioned i avoided con crud um and a nice thing that's happened since I've been back, I'm not sure if it was because I was gone for so long, but since I've been back from C2E2 from Chicago, my dog Phyllis has been way more cuddly than she's ever been. She's like a brand new Aww. dog. So I think it's like the combination of, you know, me coming back and then the season has changed. It's nice outside. She can go outside more. There's all sorts of new things for her to smell. But uh, yeah, she's been hopping up on the couch with me while I've been reading comics and snuggling up right next to me. It's wonderful. It's really changed my life. So um, she she really That's appreciates really sweet, the sketch you got of her. That's true. She really did enjoy the, the sketch. Uh, the wonderful Mel Valentine did the commission sketch of Phyllis for me at C two E two, and uh, yeah, Phyllis seemed to like it. Uh, she sniffed it and then walked away. So I guess that's a stamp of approval. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, as far as comics go, I read a bunch of comics this week, and a couple really stood out to me as being exceptionally enjoyable. Uh, one was the new Dial H for Hero, 
series that just launched. That's issue number one, uh, written by Sam Humphreys, art by Joe Quinones. Um, if you know Silver Age DC, you know Dial H for Hero is one of the greatest Silver Age DC concepts there is. Essentially, uh, the idea is that a kid has a, a rotary phone dial, and if he dials H or spells out Hero, you know, it varies in the different incarnations, he will turn into a random superhero. It's been relaunched a couple times over the past years. Uh, there was a new 52 Dial H series that was really enjoyable. This is a much more kid friendly, um, fun take on the concept. It's part of the Wonder Comics imprint that Brian Michael Bendis is doing over at DC. And uh, I really enjoyed it. I love that concept. Um, this is a pretty fun one. The Basically, the premise is that there's a kid named Miguel who was once rescued by Superman and then since then has wanted the thrill of being a superhero. You know, it's something he's wanted to recreate in his life. You know, the thrill of flying since Superman saved him. And um, he somehow becomes in possession of this glowing red telephone. He dials H and turns into a superhero named Monster Truck. And um, <laughs> it's awesome. So Joe Quinonez, his artwork is very like clean. It fits the Silver Age aesthetic really well. It's like just like clean lines, you know, bright sh- colors. It's really lovely. But then when he does the pages where Miguel is Monster Truck, he draws it like Rob Liefeld style. And it's awesome. So he's, I'm just turning the page and all of a sudden I'm looking at like an image comic from 1993. And it really took me back to that place when I was a kid reading comics. And there's a bunch of like, you know, uh, bad puns where Monster Truck is telling people, you know, uh, uh, life, the world is a highway, say 10 Ford to Vengeance and stuff while he's smashing cars. <laughs> it's it's awesome. It really does is. He smash any car- does he smash any cars while saying, truck, yeah? Uh, he, do- he does um, say, truck, yeah. Uh, but not it. while he's smashing a car. But he does say Hasta la Vista cars and then four wheels bad, 18 wheels, awesome. So oh my God. <laughs> it's a fantastic comic book. I just, maybe you can't tell, but that's exactly my kind of thing. In a comic yeah, you book, don't so. get a lot of Animal Farm <laughs> references. <laughs> right, right. Uh, it, it, it's good stuff. It's, it's very good stuff. Um, excited to see how that how that goes. Going forward, uh, the other book that kind of stood out to me was Glow Number One. This is the adaptation of the uh, Netflix series, The Gorgeous Ladies of Wrestling. I was very excited about this book because written by our favorite here on the show, Teeny Howard, uh, with art by Hannah Templer. And it's really, really fun. Uh, again, it takes the concept of the TV show and kind of runs with it and plays with it. So the setup here is that the the women on the show have to go to the WrestleFest convention in Reseda, which is, you know, far, a little way out of the ways. And they're going there and they're kind of nervous because it'd be actual, you know, legit professional wrestlers there. And they're nervous about performing in front of them. Um, they have to raise money to make the trip to get there. So that's most of this uh, first issue is them coming up with clever ways to raise money. It's a much more lighthearted take on the characters than the TV show is. Um, I kind of enjoy that because I think Teeny Howard's really good at that kind of stuff. Um, and she's really good at doing the character interactions. She writes the characters in the voices you would hear on the show. You, you know exactly who you're talking to. If you've seen the show, you know exactly you know who these characters are and what they're doing and their motivations. Um, and also, Templar's artwork is much more cartoony and loose um, than the show, which works because it's not like too spot eye. You know, if some if an artist tries to do a likeness of an actor that's too close, it's off-putting. It's good that she sort of simplified everything. You can still tell who everyone is. They look like them. It's basically like, you know, the cartoony version of that actress, you know, done really well, you know? So I really, really enjoyed it. If, if you're a fan of the TV show and you like those characters, there's no reason you wouldn't love this take on that on that with this book. Right. Good, that, good thing that they avoided the whole Uncanny Valley situation. I know. I'm really glad. Uh, it, it, it's a le- very lovely style that she has for it. And then uh, Rebecca Natley, uh, Nalty, Rebecca Nalty does the colors. And uh, yeah, it's a bright, fun, poppy sort of look to the book that I think uh, makes the makes the story a lot more lighthearted, which is, I think, good for that. I wouldn't want a really depressing story with these characters. It's almost like, you know, the Saturday morning cartoon version of Glow, <laughs> which... Uh, which is, oh, which cute. you know, which works totally. You know, I, I think those characters and pro wrestling itself is so over the top that you kind of need to go there with it to have it work. But mm-hmm. yeah, highly recommended. 
Well, that's what we read this past week. And of course, there are more comic books coming out this week because they never stop. Uh, <laughs> and new books come out this Wednesday, April 3rd. Uh, Brian, what are you excited for this week at the comic shop? This week, I'm really looking forward to picking up the Marvel team up number one. And I know I keep going at these Marvel team up books, like Charlie Brown running down that football. Sure. Like, <laughs> is Lucy going to yank it out from in front of me? Almost certainly. Yes. <laughs> but it's it's Miss Marvel and Spider Man teaming up. I mean, okay. it's it's going to be Quip Central, and that's that's my jam. You know, I grew up on that. Wait, who's? Who's Spider-Man now? Is Are you talking Miles Spider-Man or Peter Spider-Man? I think this is Peter Spider-Man. I was hoping it would be Miles I, I, Spider-Man when I first saw that it was coming out because I like the teens. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, after Spider-Verse happened, I just kind of assumed that there were Spider-People everywhere yeah. for the rest of time in the Marvel Universe, <laughs> so I have to ask. No, no, fair question. This one is written by Eve Ewing with lines by Joey Vasquez, um, which Eve Ewing wrote the latest Ironheart series that's been coming out, and Vasquez did some work on Spider Geddon. So they're both creators who I was work I'm familiar with and who I trust. So I think that I'm, I'm not worried about it being a low quality comic. I'm just worried about it suffering from all the same pitfalls that all the big Marvel event books suffer from. Sure. So is this is this like a one shot or is it an ongoing series? It I seems no. I think it's a mini series. Okay. Okay. I I pay so little attention to Marvel, that's what I'm just kinda of curious. I know like the Marvel team up or the Marvel two in one, like that's a like a long running sort of legacy title in a weird way. So it's it's always interesting to see them relaunch it, you know, as a mini series, I guess. Um but is it just Spider-Man teaming up with different people? Because I know I think that was the way it was in the past. Basically, the two-in-one was always featuring Spider-Man and guest starring, you know, so and so. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not totally sure. The cover that I saw for this uh, featured Spider-Man and Miss Marvel pretty prominently, but it mm -hmm. also had other characters sort of fanning out behind them. So I don't know if it's going to be a whole big team where they're all together, and Spider-Man and Miss Marvel were just the two who were focused on in the synopsis I looked at, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but. Those are the characters who I'm kind of most excited to see together. Right. Right. Yeah, and I'm always a sucker for a good team-up story. So, yeah, it's always kind of appealing to check that stuff out. But, but if it is tied into a bigger event or a crossover, that's, you know, that's a red flag, I guess. But Yeah, especially with War of the Realms coming out this week as well. Yeah. It, it, it makes me real apprehensive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could definitely see that. Uh, but, yeah, I might have to flip through that if I see it on the stands on Wednesday. I'm curious. Always like a good uh, Spider-Man team up. Uh, Kara, what about you? What are you looking forward to this week? Okay, so people who are regular listeners to this show will know that I have a very, very deep personal attachment to Teen Titans, but I haven't actually read a Teen Titans comic in a while, mostly because after Final Crisis, DC kind of lost me. And it, I, just, I just got tired of having to learn a new continuity that then got rebooted again and again. And it's like, guys, I, I knew what you were doing and now I don't, and I don't have the time and money or interest to continue. But that said, there is, they're doing um a, a new, like periodically they shuffled the lineup of the Teen Titans team. And it looks like the current lead is Damian Wayne, or uh, mm -hmm. Robin and I low key forgot that he existed, and when I saw him <laughs> on the cover of the the Teen Titans Full Throttle trade paperback, which is out this week, I was like, "Oh right, oh right, I like you. You're terrible." So <laughs> like, right there, I'm like, "Okay, Damien's not exactly a team player, but you're putting him at the head of the Teen Titans. I'm intrigued. Go on." And then in the solicit for the title, they go on to explain that Lobo who is everyone's favorite third like fourth wall breaking awful space biker mm -hmm. mercenary person uh in very uh very kiss-esque face makeup apparently has a, an illegitimate daughter now named crush and <laughs> i have so many questions <laughs> But mostly I'm like, how have you not done this before? <laughs> like, That's awesome. Like, yeah. like Lobo's one of those characters where if you 
if you've if you've read DC Comics in a broad capacity, you're aware of who he is, and you're aware that even if you don't like him personally, the people at DC seem to like him an awful lot because they put him in everything. I feel like he's almost their weird, like, twisted answer to Deadpool, but I think he came first as a character. <laughs> so maybe Deadpool is, like, a more mainstream version of Lobo with, like, more pop culture references. But Yeah, I feel like they're, they're both responses to the same cultural desire to have this goofy fourth wall breaker. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, like, any anytime DC does something to kind of expand the mythology around the Lobo character, like, for example, giving him an illegitimate daughter who is now on the Teen Titans, I'm like, okay, money grabbers, but I'm interested. <laughs> 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 yes, yeah, that piques my interest quite a bit as well. Um, <laughs> yeah, I haven't followed Teen Titans either, but, you know, I, I like the idea of, you know, it being a... a maybe like legacy characters i guess that's the idea of like the team titans you have like Mar- you have robin and uh, kid flash usually and then all these like sort of legacy teenage characters but yeah uh damien doesn't seem to fit in with any of those other <laughs> characters right he's the right. odd man out so yeah. to speak yeah it looks like the team up for this one is damien um flash which i remembered wally west is black now in the comics i think mm-hmm. right so yeah. it's it's wally it's damien and there's this character crush, and then the other two characters, one of them is apparently a genie that's been released from her lamp. And mm-hmm. then there's another one that had kind of a ge- generic looking costume, but I'm like, well, but the others I'm interested, so go on. Sure. Four out of five, eight bad. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. How are you, Paul? What are you into this week? Oh, there's a new issue of Immortal Hulk coming out this week, so I'm very, very excited for that. Uh, I know I've talked about this book at length on the show but the thing is it's perfect it's so good like i cannot recommend this book more highly uh so issue 16 of immortal hulk drops this week this is uh written by al ewing with art by joe bennett the hulk is one of those characters that i remember really liking as a kid but i never could get into because when i tried to read the hulk in the you know mid to late 90s the book was a confusing mess of characters right uh all of a sudden the hulk was gray at a certain point or he was he could talk, uh, or you know, it, or he was intelligent like Bruce Banner. He was in space, teaming up with the uh, Silver Surfer. I'm like, this does not make any sense. <laughs> but I've always wanted to like the character because I think at the core, the Hulk is a fascinating, you know, character. But Al Ewing uh, with this Immortal Hulk series has basically twisted the Hulk into a horror comic, which works because he's a terrifying creature. You know, the Hulk is scary, and this this take on the character is that. The Hulk comes out at night, and the Hulk is out at night, and Bruce Banner's not there. The Hulk is in control, and he cannot be killed. Like, he is, you know, a monster, literally. And as the series has gone on, Al Ewing has sort of laid down these pieces to explain that all the other Marvel characters that are related to the Hulk or have been infused with gamma radiation, you know, like the Hulk has, like uh, Sasquatch, um, Doc Samson, even... uh, Betty Banner and her father, Thunderbolt Ross, they all have this sort of connection to the gamma radiation that is almost supernatural. So I think what Al Ewing is doing is really taking the Hulk concept, the gamma radiated monster concept, and making it a horror concept and taking it to places it's never gone before, but still rooting it in the, what you recognize to be the Hulk. And I I think that in, I don't want to get on my soapbox too much, but I think that in like 10 or 15 years, people are going to point at this series and being, this is like a landmark series of marvel is done like this is one of the best things i've done in a long time in my uh in my opinion although i don't read much marvel i maybe oh. can't speak to that but i think it's great you know well, i have a question about what yeah. you just said about the gamma radiation is yes. it is it that these characters who have gamma radiation do they is it kind of like they're connected to one another in a deeper way or is it just there's enough similarities between their powers like what did you mean when you said that i i think the what Ewing is suggesting is that there's something supernatural or unpredictable about the way gamma radiation affects people. So all these people, like, so the most recent issues, um, they've been talking about the fact that they've, all these characters have come back from the dead. You know, Bruce Banner has been dead a bunch. The Hulk's been dead a bunch. Uh, Betty Banner died. Uh, Doc Samson died, but they've all come back. So there's almost this idea that the gamma radiation is, prevents them from ever dying. You know what I mean? So they're connected that way. Oh, okay. And then early on, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, because it sounded kind of like 
what DC does sometimes with their concepts of the green and the red, like the green right. yeah. being all the plant life on Earth and characters like Poison Ivy can kind of tap into that connection and network or Animal Man uh, tapping into the red of this like, I guess, like blood based network of, of animals. Um, mm-hmm. So these these larger world building concepts of connectivity through some kind of elemental primal force is so fascinating to me, especially since that seems more like a like a magic or fantasy concept, but they yeah. like shoehorn it into this world of superheroes. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's the way I would explain it. You know, that's early on in this series, um, the Hulk is making a bunch of references to the green door and how like there's something calling him from behind the green door and you can't open the green door. And it's like, it, it is tying in this elemental thing, but it's also a straight up just horror concept. You know what I mean? So I like the blending of superheroes with a horror concept without it being, you know, corny. Like I think Ewing is doing something very smart and, to their credit, Marvel has not made the series crossover with anything else yet. Fingers crossed it doesn't happen. But I think as a sort of, if you want to read a Marvel book without worrying about having to cross over into other stuff or a big event book uh, protruding into it or interrupting the story, Immortal Hulk is a good book, guys. I can't, like I said, I can't recommend it highly enough. I think it's a perfect comic book right now. Can I say something about about the Hulk real quick before we have our break? Sure. Because, yeah. uh, so I read, I, I read this week um like this like one of those like listicles like thing like 25 things you don't know about the marvel cinematic universe and i was like try me and (laughs) there's a lot a lot i don't know for example so you know how in the early 2000s they made the hulk movie and then they Mm -hmm. were like well that was garbage so let's do it again but it was still garbage and then by the time they got to the avengers they're like okay well that second Hulk movie is technically part of what we're doing here, but now Mark Ruffalo's the Hulk, and we're just going to kind of not allude to anything that happens in those films whatsoever. Yeah, so, yeah. so in that second Hulk film where, oh, I'm blanking on his name, the guy who was in Fight Club who wasn't Brad Pitt. Edward Norton. Yeah, where he was the Hulk, or mm-hmm. Bruce Banner. So apparently there was like a deleted scene from that or one that like didn't i forget if it was like deleted or didn't quite get shot where he was like in the arctic contemplating like killing himself and Mm. through the ice you were gonna see like frozen steve rogers so okay like sure tying in all this stuff and in a later avengers movie like the whole like bruce banner does kind of allude to there being a real dark moment where he was thinking, like, should I even be alive? But they were actually going to show that and make it a more like, oh, look, kids, there's Captain America. And I'm like, oh, thank God you didn't do that. <laughs> yes. yes. Like, that would have just been <laughs> like, I, I know that the Hulk is very much like your kind of Frankenstein's monster situation, but do you have to be that mm-hmm. on the nose with it? Like, come on. <laughs> well, I, again, I mean, this is maybe a, a bigger conversation for another show or something, but I the Hulk is interesting to me because I don't think he usually works as a character, you know what I mean? Like it's it's a very hard character to make work. Like the Hulk is a good eight or sixteen page story, like the first Hulk story. But like, what do you do with that? You know, and I, th- I think attempts to there have been attempts to make it interesting, but you kind of have to push the boundaries of it. Like, what are the memorable Hulk runs of the past you know twenty years? They send him into space and he's a gladiator on another planet. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> that's what you have to do to make the Hulk interesting. So even in the Marvel movies, like he's a great present on screen as part of the team but yeah those solo movies are never going to work because i don't think the character stands alone as a character that well in a story you know poor hulk poor poor hulk exactly One quick note before we get started with uh, this episode's topic. We, of course, have a Patreon page. Uh, we thank all of un- everyone out there who's donated already. But we launched a $1 tier on Patreon, which means that for a dollar, you can support the show and get access to all of our Patreon-only audio that we're doing. Uh, we have some stuff going up there very soon that I'm very excited about. Mike and I are doing a Doom Patrol reread that'll be up, I think, uh, in the next couple weeks. If you want to listen to that... You can donate a dollar to the Patreon and you'll have access to all that stuff over there. So make a note of that. 
Uh, that out of the way, we can jump into the topic for this week, which is comic book collectibles. Uh, here we're talking about not comics themselves, because obviously we collect those, but sort of the tangential tchotchkes that the comic book store gives out, promotional items, statues, toys, all the stuff that's comic book related that maybe we collect or maybe don't. So um, in our notes here, I noticed, Kara, you have some thoughts about this, so I want to maybe start with you to say, uh, what is your thought about comic book collectibles and what do you collect? in that regard at my now defunct local comic store where i came up as a comics reader uh there were like two full walls in the store that were just glass cases full of statues so it was like every single week when i went in i'm just staring at those statues like man that looks cool or man who would pay 200 dollars for that and this one glorious time the shop owner was away for the weekend so the guys running the store decided to have a sale where like all the statues were 50% off. So my friend and I bought like six. <laughs> 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 we were like we're like, well, full price doesn't sound great, but 50% off. <laughs> she got she got she bought me uh an Admiral Akbar statue that i was waffling on because i'm like i don't need it she's like shut up for 25 dollars. i'm just gonna buy it for you like you do need it and he like dude sits on my desk he's been in, on, on my desk at, for my last two jobs he reminds me that it's all a trap yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and, the real trap uh, is capitalism I, the real trap is capitalism oh my god don't talk to me about my makeup budget this month it's a disaster i just ugh, i'm such a consumer anyway uh so, and I got a few of the, uh, like, DC <laughs> statues for some of the female characters that I always really enjoyed. And they they actually had, like, they're always going to hypersexualize those characters, but they had some that were, like, really pretty also. Like, there was this Poison Ivy where she's just, like, reaching her arm up as <laughs> if she's reaching towards the sun. And I just thought that was the prettiest thing. And I was, like, I had this very clear vision of me, like growing up and getting my own place and having like a vanity with all my like lipsticks and perfumes and this like poison ivy just like as a graceful accessory um but capitalism so i don't have a house i have a room and there's no room for a vanity so that that dream lingers on but uh so like i had i had those and then a couple years ago I had some more disposable income and i just got like really Mm. crazy about action figures but not 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 in the not in the like never remove from box way more in the oh you have plastic representations of all these characters that i love i'm going to buy all of them like at uh, new york comic con there are always a few people with just like bins of action figures that have been loved and played with but like i got like everyone from justice league unlimited that i loved as a character in like a three inch high like plastic action figure and i kind of I kind of calmed down on that because, like, w- like when I was working at Comixology, it was just like everyone's desks were action figures. So I think that kind of fed into it where I was just like, well, I'll just put it on my desk at work. And now that I don't work there anymore, I'm like, what do I do with all of this plastic? I have zero shelf space. I can't do that to my desk at work at my current job. So, like, I weeded out a bunch of my action figures and the stuff that, like, made the cut is just kind of sitting in a Sephora bag in my closet Mm because there's nowhere for me to display them. And I'm just looking at this now because we're talking about like, oh, rampant consumerism. And I'm like, oh, this is a lot of plastic that's just going to sit in the ocean. (laughs) So I'm like, (laughs) I'm having like a real internal moral conflict about the whole collectible concept Mm -hmm. because I'm like so wasteful. Like I get mad when I see Funko Pops at conventions because I'm like, you're going to be in a landfill in like three years. Mm-hmm. And why? I know the answer is money, but why? <laughs> so, <laughs> so really, you you hanging on to all these action figures is the ecologically responsible exactly. thing to do. Oh, don't don't tell me that. I'll like never <laughs> let them go. I think conceptually, at the back of my mind, I was like, oh, like I enjoy these now, and I'll hold on to them if I ever have kids. And I'm like, Kara, that's a horrible. Like, why? Are, what if they grow mold or something? Like, that's what happened to your Barbie dolls. <laughs> like, <laughs> just. I think I'm doing the right thing, and then it turns out to just be extra wasteful. Anyway, so I like kind of calmed down on that stuff, and I'm trying to be like more thoughtful in how I spend my money in terms of 
getting additional products to support properties that I like. Yeah, yeah. This is kind of more aspirational at this point because money, but um, periodically some of the comic book companies do some really interesting things with jewelry. Like um, I forget what, what company it was, but DC teamed up with this jewelry company a few years ago and did a really interesting line of pieces inspired by Catwoman and Wonder Woman that weren't, that were like beautiful pieces of jewelry in and of themselves that did interesting things with those character influences, but everything like started at $200 and I was a college kid and I was like, no, (laughs) no cute, but no, but like that concept appeals to me or some of the nicer, um, clothing Mm -hmm. things that happen. Like, um, this is maybe more of like a, a movie situation, but for example, I was looking on, the shop Disney website because they own my soul and um, they had like a really, really beautiful uh, Black Panther cardigan that just like looks like a really cool cardigan, but the lines on it are inspired by T'Challa's costume. And I'm like, Oh, you're so expensive, but you're so nice and I could wear you in real life. So like things like that where I'm like, all right, how do I like tell the nerds that I'm one of them, but don't tell everyone else that I'm a nerd. <laughs> like, like let them talk yeah. to me before they judge me. Um, but in ter- like when I think comic book collectibles, I think more like like stuff that you get at the back of the previews catalog. Like any piece of merchandise that a comic shop owner can get, I'm like that in my head is the comic book collectible category. Sure. And the thing that I have from that that it's like it's so useless, but I will never give it up. Is like again more more movie tie in than like directly related to the comics, but um, there was a like after the first Avengers film where like you know spoiler alert seven year old spoiler alert everyone, but you know uh, Agent Phil Coulson dies or does he? And he like had this bit where he's he's like a huge nerd about Captain America and he's like I have your trading cards. And so Marvel released this like collectible set of the Captain America trading cards that Coulson like it was like based off the prop set he had in the movie. Mm-hmm. But the this set came with a set of the cards and then a set of the cards that were dyed to look like they're full of blood stains from oh. when he dies. Yeah. And I'm like Oh, you bastards, but also I bought it. <laughs> so, like, that's definitely my collectible thing where I'm like, this is so dumb, but I need it. <laughs> yeah, I could see that. So, th- the idea of a comic book collectible as almost like an impulse buy, like, it speaks to the nerd in you, even though it serves no practical purpose, right? No purpose whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. Like they're uh, sitting on my bookcase at my parents' house. When will I ever bring them out to show anyone? Never. But sometimes I look at them and they make me very happy. So I guess that's the whole point. Exactly. That's all that matters. Yeah, they, yeah. they spark joy, right? <laughs> Perfect. Um, you know, it's interesting because, you know, I, I grew up getting into comics during the boom of the speculator era in the speculator boom in comics where, you know, image comics had just launched. Uh, you'd go to the store and you'd get your comics, but they would come poly bagged with trading cards, you know, and you had to buy two copies cause you couldn't open the one that was, you know, bagged with the, the cards. You had to buy another copy to open up and read, you know? And I, I remember being a sucker for that at the time. Like I, I used to have the, the, the black, uh, poly bagged, uh, copy of superman 75 or they know the death you of superman and everyone else oh, literally oh then i also had the one that was a white poly bag which contained a uh a superman the symbol armband that you could wear you know uh to show you were mourning for the death of superman and a big poster in it too of course i opened that right that one right up for some reason yeah yeah but of course yeah all you needed that the armband i needed the armband i needed to wear it you know to show people that i, I was sad that superman died um it was important to me <laughs> so I, I have 
a history of all that stuff, you know, and my introduction into being a comic book fan is from having all of the superpowers action figures when I was a kid. You know, that's how I learned about superheroes is from the super friends cartoon and the superpowers action figure. So I have all that stuff. That was my gateway into comic book dumb. And I, they're still in the big plastic tub in my parents' house, all missing legs and arms and all the accessories are, you know, mixed up in a separate Ziploc bag. Uh, but the, it, those stuff, things are important to me because that's what introduced me into those characters. But, you know, so now as a guy in his mid thirties who doesn't have a lot of real estate to have plastic hunks laying around his, his room or his house, I don't see much use in that stuff anymore. The young me totally bought into the Marvel trading cards. I had binders of trading cards of Marvel characters with the power rankings on the back and all that stuff. But nowadays, like I'm way more frugal with both money and space, so I don't have as much of that stuff. I don't see the point of it, you know. Yeah, and that, that's that's fair too. Like I said, like I, I I I live in a room, so my action figures live in a bag because mm-hmm. there is no space for them in the room. So it's, you know, sometimes people reality of space changes especially if you're living in an urban area or an expensive suburban area like yeah you might not have the Mm -hmm. space that you want to display all the things that you want and then i see people's houses where they do have like oh this is my like this is my room with all my stuff in it and i'm like i am literally looking at thousands (laughs) of dollars of plastic that you will never be able to resell like what happened here (laughs) right Right. Uh, yeah. And again, like all the collectible stuff, all that 90s stuff, the the poly bagged, you know, stuff that came with the Rob Liefeld trading cards, that's all in the dollar bin. If I want that stuff again, I can go <laughs> literally buy them all for a dollar back at my local comic shop, you know, so. But that's again, but I, what's interesting is that it's not so much the cost, I think, that is a deterrent to most people, because it's the, again, as you mentioned, Kara, it's the idea of it meaning something to you. You know what I mean? Like, that's why, for me, having a statue on my desk of, say, Superman doesn't make any sense. But I, I do have the Superman Burger King drinking cup that I had since I was a kid sitting on my desk, you know, because that speaks to me, even though it is a useless hunk of plastic <laughs> that is, you know, is Superman holding a cup with the Burger King logo on it. But it sparks joy in me because I remember having that as I was a kid, you know, so it's more about the memory that, as opposed to that physical object. It's a cup of Superman holding a cup? No, no, it's uh, it's a plastic <laughs> cup, but the handle is uh, like basically like a plastic Superman. You know oh, what I mean? oh, that sounds cool though. I'm into it's that. It's awesome. <laughs> um, let me see. Let me pull so, it out here. Let me get the the date on here. This says 1988. Ooh, that's older than me. I was going to say 1988. <laughs> me too. <laughs> uh, but I I see what you're saying about you know some things just reminding you of an experience or some things, even if you don't hold on to them, you still have fond memories associated with them. So for example, again, not, not exactly comics related, but while we're on the subject of action figures, so this uh, cast your minds back pre star Wars, the force awakens They're like, everyone's like, Oh man, this is it. We're, we're about to like get something that's not the prequels. That's still star Wars. Like, let's do it. I'm ready. And the Disney hype machine was yes. in overdrive. And they had that whole like Force Friday thing like months before the movie even happened. I think it was like the movie was coming out in December and Force Friday was in September where they were doing like an initial product drop of a lot of things that were related to the new film. And I had been at a Jets game that day I, w- I was in new york i was at a jets game i am not interested in football i've tried so many times it's just not for me but a friend had free tickets and i like free events let's go so coming back from the meadowlands after this game got us into midtown manhattan like i want to say 10 10 30 at night and we're like i had to walk across town to get to uh, Grand Central Station because I was living in the suburbs at the time. So to get cross town in Midtown, you go through Times Square. And as I'm walking through Times Square, I'm like, "What's that big line outside Toys R Us?" R.I.P. I'm like, <laughs> "Oh, 
oh, it's Force Friday. <gasps> Star Wars stuff. And I had like a minute where I just froze on the sidewalk, which P.S. <laughs> please don't do that. If you go to New York, you will get run over. People will hate you. I like I did. I did the cardinal sin of like freezing on a New York City sidewalk. And I was like, do I mm-hmm. wait in that line? Am I going to be that person? Like, I'm I'm here. I, I wouldn't have gone out of my way to come to this, but like I'm here and like maybe maybe I'll be part of the magic. Maybe it'll happen. So I I was like, you know what? I'm still feel p- feeling pretty awake. Let's do this. And I walked over to the line and I stood in the line for an hour and a half and they didn't or more than that because they I don't think they actually ended up letting everyone mm. in until like 1230 mm. in the morning. And, like, it's Times Square. It's bright as day. Everyone's just, like, hyped on Star Wars. No one's really, like, worried about missing sleep or anything. There's still tourists walking around. It's all good. At, like, midnight, they usually do, like, a light show anyway. So everyone's having a good time. My phone is charged. It's fine. And uh, I get inside, and it's intense. There's, like, all the people who work there are dressed in Star Wars costumes. They've, like, hired Star Wars costume actors. Like, I walk into the Toys R Us, and Darth Vader is coming right at me. And I'm like, holy shit, it's Darth Vader. Like, Darth Vader in actual... Like, they had the great costumes, like, movie-level caliber costumes. Like, all these stormtroopers. Oh, my God. So, I get upstairs, and it is, like, really well-regulated pandemonium. Like, they just made this, like, center pit of all these new Star Wars toys. And I had like, even though I hadn't planned on going, I had done my research ahead of time. And I'm like, yo, I'm getting a Captain Phasma action figure like Wendell and Christie represent. So, so I go in and I like do a quick scan of everything. And it's very clear that there are no more like little three inch Captain Phasmas. And I must have looked so sad because one of the workers came up to me and he was like, can I, can I help you? And I was like, do you have any more Captain Phasmas? And he's like, oh, well, yeah, but we're not supposed to release them until tomorrow morning because we need to like space out when we're releasing them. And I was like, oh, I came here for her. And I must have been really pathetic looking because he like disappeared and reappeared like two minutes later with one of those action figures. And he was like, this never happened to tell my boss and then like vanished into the crowd again. <laughs> I was so excited. So I like get in line and I like pay my whatever it was like $8 for my action figure. And I go on home and I think I got home at like two or three in the morning. It was fine. But like, I like looking back on that, I'm like, Kara, that was so dumb. Why did you do that? But like, I love that memory. Cause just like, you know, stuff like mm-hmm. that only happens once. So you just got to do it. And then of course, like, a, a coworker had known that I was into this action figure idea, so had actually like bought a bunch of them to distribute to people that he knew was into it. So that it was like I didn't even need to wait in that line because one was waiting for me at work. But like, so I ch- so I took one out of the box, and the other one I was like, oh, I'll leave this in the box, and it'll be a collectible, and it'll be great. And when I was trying to like resell some of my action figures this past summer, I very quickly learned that basically nothing has good resale value. So if you're going to buy something, you better buy it because you love it and not because you think you're going to make money off of it because those Phasma figures are like 50 cents on eBay now. So, (laughs) you know, even if it's in the box, like 50 other people are trying to sell the same thing. You can't even like undercut anyone. At that point, I'm just kind of like, well, I mean, I guess I'll keep you. I guess I have two of these now. I guess I'll hold on to them forever so I don't contribute to landfill waste. Like, oh, my God. So, (laughs) you know, so so kind of like Paul was saying, like, you know, where am I going to put this? I don't have anywhere to put it now. I just have two Phasmas. Two Phasmas is better than one, I guess, or are better than one. Um, You're living life in the Phasma land out there. (sighs) Much better, Ryan. Good job. Um, I had to contribute something to this conversation. Well, maybe that's why I want to include you here, Brian, but... It, maybe so, Carrie. We're talking about this idea of collectibles, not as investments. So, I, I guess I'm curious what purpose these things serve to us, right? Since resale value isn't it, they speak to us on a sort of a an innate nerdy level. So, uh, Brian, are there any uh, things that you have, or maybe you remember having that sort of trigger that same sort of uh, connection? Actually, while while Kara was telling that Phasma story, it reminded me of the. Uh the war machine action figure Ooh. that a friend of mine gave me in elementary school. I have no idea where it went or what happened with it, but he had Iron Man and he gave me war machine and we just like chased each other around making them fight. This is like 
third grade or fourth grade, I think. So when I saw the energy to chase something. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's just, uh, it's, this is one of the things about having these conversations because I had completely forgotten that, that happened until mm-hmm. we were having this conversation and suddenly I just had this, this crystal clear memory of, like, I can see the playground that we were on. And I think that, like Kara was saying, the, the memory of these things, or the memories they come with, is the important part of them. Like, it like it makes you feel connected in a different way. Like, like reading the story makes you emotionally attached to certain characters or concepts, and then having an addis- additional like physical manifestation of that thing can it's it's almost like you can like channel whatever it is that appeals to you about that character into this item that you introduce into your life. Yeah, something that you can you can hold and interact with it feels so much more real than some words on a page. <laughs> Yeah, and I think there is something sort of innately nostalgic about reading comics. I, I mean, for me personally, I mean, I, I grew up reading comics, and I, as I mentioned, I have a connection to DC because of the superpowers action figures. Like, that is a very important part of my life. You know, that's uh, what I grew up on. And what I find interesting is that I find myself buying collectible items that I find in thrift stores or antique shops rather than buying stuff out of the, at my comic shop. You know what I mean? You know, my comic book shop has no shortage of things that they have in stock or they could order for me statuettes, action figures, but I do have some random uh, items from the sixties or the seventies that are Batman or Superman related, you know, that I've bought at antique stores because I think there's something that more reminds me of my childhood. You know, there's an object that someone owned and then gave up, there is a deeper nostalgic connection to objects like that, as opposed to, you know, the multicolored Green Lantern rings I got from my comic shop during the, uh, you know, the big uh, Green Lantern crossover a few years ago, which are just sitting in a drawer somewhere. I have no idea where, I, where they went. Those things don't mean anything to me, but, you know, the weird Batman puzzle from 1966 I found at the antique store a few years ago, that is more important to me. Does that make sense? Yeah, Totally. Oh, I remember those rings. I was really, really upset when I realized that they were made for big chubby man fingers <laughs> and not delicate little lady fingers. So uh, that was that was a very visceral representation to me that these things were not made with people <laughs> like me in mind. And that was definitely a moment for me where I was like, well, comics, screw you too. <laughs> like, you're making jewelry, but you're not making it for women. Like, come on. <laughs> They're not. It's not jewelry. They're power rings, Kara. Come on, jewelry. Magic wishing, ri- magic wishing rings. Jewelry. It's a big difference. <laughs> there was a. There's like a, a, a. That that it really was my my problem with a lot of this stuff is like a lot of a lot of uh, superhero power stuff is ring based. So it's like maybe I want that ring that will make me feel like I too could have this power, but like. All the mass-produced rings are made with dude ring sizes. Like, there is a a really great-looking mm. Legion of Superheroes ring that I saw a few years ago, but it, like, started at ring size 8 or something, and I'm like, cool, it's going to, like, slip off my thumb. Thanks, DC. <laughs> sure. Love you, too. Yeah. So, make more stuff for girls. Exactly. Yes. Uh, because I think what those promotional items the purpose that they serve again is to get people in the store to get people excited about the thing and like if they're only aimed at you know one half of your audience what's the point you know what i mean so um is there anything i'm trying to think of stuff that i'm collecting now since i mean we were just at c2e2 majority of the con floor is dedicated to you know these promotional items collectibles tchotchkes action figures Obviously, a lot of Funko Pops <laughs> everywhere that you look. Mm. Um, I will admit, I have a few Funko Pops, but they're not comic book related. I have an Andre the Giant, I have a uh, Rowdy Rowdy Piper, and I have a Joey Ramone. So I guess if you're going to encapsulate my personality in Funko Pops, there's the Holy Trinity, I guess. Um, <laughs> it's, like, it's like, I get it. It's like a simple mold. It's really easy to customize. The, and like the appeal is they can do all these characters that wouldn't normally get an action figure or a piece right. of merchandise made for them. I get that. But why do there have to be so many of them i have a flash from when they were like just starting out um i think i got it at a hot topic god forgive me and it was like like it's still on my bookcase it's super cute but like 
I don't know. I got over that real quick. But like like you said, like we just went through this show floor where basically everything was merchandise. So when you guys were going through that floor, did you see anything where you're like, oh, I would have bought that a few years ago? Or did you see stuff where you were just like, why does anyone want that? That was my the second reaction was definitely my major point is like, who has the money for this? And where are they going to keep it? You know, what I mean, I have the more practical response. But yeah, um, at at the con, I found myself more interested in buying prints or commissions. I guess that is a somewhat type of collectible thing. I find myself mm-hmm. buying a lot of prints from artists that I like, which is that thing where instead of buying a hunk of plastic, which might have a sort of emotional or nostalgic connection, here I am giving money to directly to someone whose work I like and saying, here, I, I'm supporting you. It's less about the print itself. It's more about me supporting someone whose art I like, you know? Like a just take my money situation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, there was, so there was one item where speaking of like, where do you have space for that? There was one item I saw at the con that just, it fascinated me. I saw it in like three or four different booths. There was this like, three foot tall stuffed pork okay that was th- it was 300 for 300 dollars. you could own this enormous stuffed pork and i'm like where would you keep that also like 300 dollars. that's like that's like six eyeshadow palettes from urban decay like come on <laughs> so <laughs> so you know so that was that was my moment where I was like, I see the appeal in this, but still I have so many questions. Right. Brian, did you see anything like that on the floor? Uh, I, the only thing that I saw that really gave me pause was a booth that was selling uh, body pillow cases. Okay. And that was more of just a, uh, like, like, I'm not trying to yuck anybody's yum. You know, I don't want to, I'm not trying to cast judgment, but there were a lot of them. And it just got me thinking, like, how many do you need? (laughs) Because I assume that when you buy the body pillow, it comes with one. Like, how many waifus does one man need? Well, okay, so on the first day of the con, I walked past a booth like that when I was with Mike and Nick. And it was all, like, the pillows were all of these, like, very chiseled anime dudes. And... Mike and Nick almost immediately started like teasing me that I was going to buy one. And I'm like, guys, like, I don't, I, I think you've been mis- slightly misunderstanding my brand here, but like, <laughs> like, I see why you would make this connection, but please don't. Like, I'm, I'm not quite on that level. So shut up. <laughs> yeah. And like, like, I mean, no disrespect. If that's your thing, that's your thing. I'm not trying to be an asshole here, but it did give me pause. Well, so maybe to follow that up, Brian, um, with a positive reading of that criticism, um, it's it's an interesting reminder when I see these types of collectibles that how how big tent you know nerddom is. You know, I mean, there's something for everyone, literally. You know, and even mm-hmm. though it's something I might not understand or want to collect or have in my house, like I'm glad that stuff exists for people so they can have that sort of connection that I have with the stuff I like. You know what I mean? So I, I like the idea idea of collectibles serving that type of purpose even though that might not be for me i like the idea of see people being able to engage with the things that they love at that level as long as it means something to them as long as it has a real emotional weight and not just you know speculating i'm gonna buy this and flip it on ebay that's real pretty scummy but you know also rarely works it, it, yeah. exactly exactly so i i, I think collectible stuff i definitely see the importance and the appeal of it the promotional stuff they have at the comic shop but I find myself, the older I get as a fan, the less interested I am in that, you know. But again, I'll always have my act- my superpowers action figures because they speak to me. I still have the very first picture books I ever had when I was a kid, the story of Superman picture books I have. They're torn to shreds. They're in terrible shape. They're falling apart. But that was the first book I ever read, which is why I love Superman. And that means something to me, which is why it is less of a collectible and more of like a memento. That makes sense. So th- items like that speak to me. That's my final statement, I guess those value, those things have value to me. And if someone wants to buy something that speaks to them in that level, more power to them. Yeah, I definitely, I, I think my relation to like comic book and nerdy collectibles has definitely shifted away from, 
things that I can display and more towards things I can wear, which is where like my nerd makeup comes in. I've got a bunch of clothes that has like nerdy stuff on it, whether it's a graphic t-shirt or a dress with a cute print or a skirt with a cute print or a purse. And like, that's a way where I can kind of incorporate the feelings I have associated with these characters more into my everyday lifestyle. So then like for, for me, if I can make it something functional, then I'm more willing to part with my money because then I'm like, oh, but I'm going to wear this or I'm going to use this in my everyday life. Whereas for or like, you know, I'm staring at a mug I have that's full of like DC heroes. Like I use that mug all the time. And like, that's something that's more functional. So for me, it's more of like the the functional aspect of collectible things at this point, as opposed to here's a thing that I'm getting for the sole purpose of displaying it. Mm-hmm. And all of my nerdy expenditure goes towards things that I can experience. So like video games or movies or things like that. So I think that's interesting that we all kind of have the thing that we spend all of our nerd money on. <laughs> <laughs> They've got us hooked, you know, uh, comic books have a long history of separating nerds from their money and it, they're still doing it quite well, apparently, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Any, any, um, I guess those are good final thoughts, but anything you want to leave uh, with before we uh, wrap it up here? I guess if you're, if you're going to be putting money into comic book collectible things, any of the things that we've been talking about on this show, like I really can't overemphasize this. Please get it. If it, is bringing you personal enjoyment don't get it just to resell it because you will probably be so sad and you might as well enjoy something if you're going to spend your hard-earned money on it yes yes and also if you do have collections of interesting stuff please let us know i kind of i like seeing people's collections of stuff you know if you've got your action figures posed on your bookshelf and stuff like that i love seeing that sort of stuff since you know i'm in a very cramped space <laughs> i can't do that i like to see other people display their stuff like that so i can live vicariously through them so share your collections with us when mike and i lived together in college that was a big feature of our living room bookshelf it was just a bunch of mike's action figures in different almost dioramas <laughs> awesome awesome uh so yeah on that note uh please let us know about all that stuff you can find us all on the internet we're all on twitter you can find kara at at kara jam uh k-a-r-a-s-z-a-m you can find brian at brian head and you can find me at oh hi Polly. you can follow the show on twitter at ircb podcast we post comic book news art links to the episodes and all sorts of stuff we have fun with over there you can also find us on goodreads where we have a group and post weekly discussion threads uh currently we are talking all about umbrella academy you can also find us on the web at ircbpodcast.com, where we have our merch store and our creator name pronunciation guide. Uh, please go out and rate, subscribe, tell your friends, share the show. It really does help us to get you know better rankings on the algorithms and yada yada. You can email us with your comments, questions, jokes, pictures of your collectible collections at ircb at destroy the org. that is at destroy the cyborg but there's a dot before the org you can subscribe on our patreon at patreon.com slash ircb podcast for exclusive audio and articles early access to top of my pile posts and more and now we have a very convenient and expensive dollar per month tier infinity shred they're the best they do the music for our show xander is a wizard he edits the show and uh, I want to thank you, uh, Kara and Brian, for joining me and thanking Mike for letting me co-host or host this episode. Uh, until next time, comics are good, and so are you. <laughs> <laughs>